Welcome everybody. Today we are entering a new territory by doing more abstract or axiomatic mathematics. If you've never been exposed to that before, this might be a little hard to get used to, but we're doing it step by step. So, here is the general abstract definition of a group by writing down the group axioms and we're not referring to any specific examples like group of symmetries or permutations or matrices. We simply let G be any set no matter how the elements look like and first of all we define a binary operation, this dot here, on this set as a map going from the Cartesian product of the set with itself. If you've never seen that before, no problem. This simply means you take two elements, A and B, of this set, a tuple. And this map must combine these two elements to give you a new element again of this set. This is important. So we land in this set again and this element is denoted by A dot B or A composed with B or whatever the, the operation may be called. For now we simply call it an operation. So A dot B again is an element of this set and this is called a binary operation. Binary because I take two elements and combine them to a new element. So then a group is the following pair. For a group we have a set and we have a binary operation on this set such that the following three axioms are satisfied. They are called the group axioms. First of all we want this operation to be associative meaning that for all elements A, B, C of the set G this holds so it doesn't matter where the parentheses are so I can drop them all together and simply write A dot B dot C. The position of the parentheses is not important. That's associativity. Then there must be an element small e of this set called an identity or sometimes the neutral element of this um, set G such that the following holds if I compose A dot E simply changes nothing. Gives me A and the same for E dot A. The, the dot notation does not mean that we have somehow a multiplication of any kind. This is just an abstract symbol for this binary operation. I could have also chosen a star or whatever but this is too hard to write down all the time so I decided to use this dot, but do not confuse it with normal multiplication. It doesn't have to be. It can be in some instances, but it doesn't have to be. So we have an identity satisfying this and group axiom number three. For each element of this set, there must be an inverse element, a to the minus one or simply a inverse, such that if I combine a with the inverse, I end up with the identity and also the other way around. A inverse combined with A gives me the identity. If a set together with a binary operation satisfies these three axioms, it is called a group. And if furthermore this here holds, AB is the same as BA for all elements AB of G, then the group is called commutative or to honor Niels Henrik Abel, it is called abelian. And the final definition, a finite group is simply a group with finitely many elements so that the cardinality of the set is any natural number between one and whatever you wish, just it must be finite, finite number of elements. That's a finite group. All right. You may always think about the examples that we did in the last uh, three lessons like groups of symmetries, permutations or matrices. But here on purpose I do not go into the examples but I want to work abstractly with these axioms. This is what this 
video is about. But on problem set number four, you'll find exercises where you have to really check is a given operation really a binary operation on that set, meaning do I end up in the set again and does it fulfill uh, the group axioms. So please go check out problem set number four for examples for this abstract definition here. Okay, we continue by really working with the axioms again without any reference to a specific example, but simply using these axioms here. And the nice thing about that is if we prove something only using these axioms, we know it applies to any group. If I prove something for a group of symmetries, for example, I can't be sure that the same is true for a group of matrices or permutations. But if I prove it using only these three abstract axioms, then the statement here is true in any group. That's the whole point of what we're doing right now. So we start with some very simple conclusions from these axioms here. If G and this operation, which I call dot, is a group, then the following is true. First of all, the identity is unique, meaning that if I have found one neutral element or one identity, I can stop looking because there can't be another one. A different identity. Second, the inverse of any element of this group here is also uniquely determined, meaning if I have found one inverse, that's enough. There can't be a second one that differs from this one here. Then if I take the inverse of the inverse of A, I end up with A again. And finally, if I take the inverse of this composition here, A dot B, inverse, beware, it's not A inverse B inverse, but B inverse A inverse. The, the order here is switched around. This is important because the group does not have to be commutative. If it is, then of course the order here um, is not important, but in general you have to write it that way. Now this all seems pretty obvious, but if you have never seen that before and never done this proof, I would highly encourage you to, to pause the video right now and try this on your own. You are only allowed to use these axioms here. We are in a group, so these axioms hold and that's it. That's all you're allowed to use. When I think about my first encounters with this stuff, uh, this was hard for me. Yeah, if you see the proof, then you say, oh, well, sure, of course, but could you have come up with it? Well, I couldn't with most of the stuff back then. Or I, took getting used to, to really know some of the tricks. All right, so pause the video, try for yourself, and if the frustration goes up, then we'll do it together. All right, please let me know in the comments if you could do at least one of those on your own, if you haven't seen the proof before. Otherwise, well, okay, it's, it's not so hard if you have seen the trick or the method before. So, here it's really hard to start if you don't know how. But a good method of showing uniqueness is you simply assume you have another element satisfying the same. So let E prime be another identity of G. And we have to show that E prime must be equal to E, the identity element of G. So we start with E prime. Then E prime is the same as E prime dot E. Why? Because E is the identity. And remember, the identity changes nothing. If I multiply is not good, if I compose with it. So we have this, but now E prime also is assumed to be an identity. So multiplying by the left or composing by the left with E prime also changes nothing, so I end up with E. And that's it. This proves that E prime equals E. All right? Now, if you see this, you say, oh, well, I could have thought of that myself, but have you? Okay, now that you have seen this, maybe it's time again to pause the video and try number two on your own. We start the same way. Let A prime be another inverse of A. 
and we have to show that a prime equals a inverse. So what can we do? We can always put an identity here because the identity changes nothing. So a prime surely is a prime dot e. And now by definition of the inverse, the identity can be written as a dot a inverse. All right. Now, this is a subtle point. We have to put parentheses here because now we have a double composition. We compose a prime with this composition here of this, those combined elements. And now we need actually associativity. This is what I meant when I said associativity will be needed in some subtle places, often in proofs. And it's easy to overlook it because we're so used to it. But very important, this here uses actually G1, the associativity. I can move the parentheses. But now I have assumed that A prime is an inverse of A. So this here gives me, by definition of inverse, the identity. And then I'm left with identity dot A inverse. And this is of course A inverse because E is the identity. So we have proven that A prime equals A inverse. And actually only after proving this, this is a good notation and we can call it the inverse of an element. Without that, it's a bit ambiguous. Okay, now this seems obvious somehow. You could argue well by the power laws minus one times minus one is one. We haven't proven any power laws yet and actually a to the minus one is not defined as we are used to as one over a and we're not in the uh, real numbers necessarily. So this is a really mean proof. You write down the definition. A times A inverse equals E equals A inverse times A dot A, whatever you want to call it. And now you look at that. This means usually we would say A inverse is a, an inverse of A. But of course we can look at that the other way around and say, well, a is also an inverse of a to the minus one because yeah, that's what this says here. But now using two, we just proved that inverses are uniquely determined. So a is the inverse of a to the minus one. What does that mean? Well, that means the inverse of this element here written a to the minus one to the minus one is a. That's it. Did you get that or would you have thought of that? It's not as easy as it looks. Okay, now the last part is not so hard. We write down this here, a dot b dot b inverse dot a inverse. At first, we need to put the parentheses here, but again, because of associativity, I can move the parentheses however I wish, so I can also simply leave them B. But if you're a beginner and do this on an exercise sheet, please write it down and do not simply drop it. So, I could also put the parentheses here and I end up with the identity. So this gives me a dot e dot a inverse, which gives me a dot a inverse, which gives me, gives me the identity. And here again, associativity, I should choose an order, but it doesn't matter. So simply remark in the beginning, because of associativity, I can drop all the parentheses here. And of course, similarly, you can show that this here is true. Again, you can drop the parentheses. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means I have an element that composed with this element gives me the identity and the other way around. But that means I have found the inverse element 
again by two because inverses are uniquely determined and I found one. So here it is, here and here. So the inverse of this element is actually this element here. And now I think you see why the order here is not as we would expect, because if the group is non-commutative and you write A inverse times B inverse, that doesn't help you because B and A inverse, they don't combine necessarily to the identity. So this is why the order is reversed. And that's it. This is our first proof only using the axioms and not using what we learned in high school about the real numbers or anything. We simply used three axioms and reduced all these properties here to using the axioms and seeing that they hold true. And now we know this is true in any group. All right, if you saw that for the first time, please let me know in the comments if this was enjoyable or how you felt uh, watching this. Now the, this week's lesson is not um, over yet, but I think this has been long enough for one video. So we'll take a short break here and video number two for this week's lesson is maybe coming in tomorrow. See you then, bye bye.